Make sure it's live. Testing, yeah. testing, testing, Hello. testing. Good morning and Good welcome morning. to Orchard Seventh day Adventist Church. Testing, testing. Good to see you all here. It's good to have the orchestra on the front row. Yes. I think it's appropriate that we stand and sing this song Rejoice, the Lord is King. Six thirteen, right? Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph Rejoice again, I say rejoice. Jesus the Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our stains, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up Rejoice again, I say, rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules. 
souls o'er earth and hell. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus. Give, lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. in glorious hope our Lord the judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home lift up your heart lift up your voice rejoice again I say Father, in our hearts, we rejoice to be in your house this morning, to sing praises to you, to worship you, to be here with you. Amen. You may be seated. Test. Good morning, church. Oh, hey, that wasn't too bad. I was afraid I might have to call 911 if I didn't get a good response. <laughs> so um, I'm up here to welcome everybody to our church. If uh, you're visiting or new, uh, we want to welcome you, let you know we have a little communication card in the f just in front of you, uh, in the pew in front of you, uh, that you can communicate with us if you're interested in joining us or have prayer requests or anything. We would welcome those and uh, respond to them. Uh, my wife, who many of you know is the secretary here, made sure and told me that I needed to keep this short and then proceeded to give me a long list of things to cover. So let's see if we can get through them. Um, I'm actually going to start from left to right in the bulletin, and I would encourage you to take a look on the inside of the bulletin because I will not cover everything. Local offer, or the offering uh, today is for the local church budget, um, and that's the loose offering for anything that uh, you put in your envelopes for special offerings. This week is for Orchard's Refurbishing Fund. Uh, this is used in such areas as the restrooms, the kitchen, and other refurbishment projects we have around the facility to keep it up to snuff. Yes. I can't hear you. Um, I'm reading the inside of the bulletin. I have for June 8. I have for, today is June 8, right? Okay, I have stand corrected again. Offering women's ministries, NAD, and special offering local evangelism. My bad. I was reading for next week's. Thank you. All right. Um, the next item. Um, I think many of you were here last week for Pastor Alex's uh, first time uh, to get to know him and to be up front. Um, just want to make everyone aware that next Sabbath, June 15 at 2 p.m. at the Hawkinson Heights Church, he will be ordained. Um, if you, Just background history, he's been with Hawkinson Heights for a couple of years before taking on both churches. So it would be really, really, really nice. The address is, is in the bulletin if we made a good showing from Orchards to just let him know that we now consider him as our pastor and we support him. So I would encourage you all to uh, plan to attend and let's see if we can't overflow that, that building. It wouldn't take much. We can do this, okay? So that's next Sabbath at 2 p.m. at the Hawkinson Heights Church and the address is in your bulletin. Also, in the back, 
2024 graduates, there are cards back there. If you know some of them, please stop and take a moment and write a quick note in their card congratulating them. We have a long list. Um, also, tamales. Um, tamales need to be ordered, or no, need to be ordered by June 7, and then they need to be picked up by Tuesday, June 11. This is our last fundraiser. Um, we have really appreciated everything the church has done. We have actually met our goal for going back to Gillette with the Pathfinders early due to all of your incredible support. So we want to say thank you very much. Um, we will be adjusting some of the giving once we get approval from the board and the finance committee. But um, through the end of this month, things will remain the same. Our offerings that we take up um, with the children's offering will still go to the Pathfinder trip, but we're hoping to get that switched back to one of the other ministries in the coming months. Um, also, on the same note, if, if you were very attentive when you drove in this morning, you may have noticed that we have two black trailers parked over here on the side rather than just our regular one trailer. And you might be wondering, how did we get that trailer back? Didn't it get stolen? Well, the answer is, yep, it got stolen, and we have finally had a chance to replace it. We got approval to uh, get a new one, and uh, we have now insured it. We have now licensed it, and I've been working with Pastor John uh, this last week in getting the railing put in on the inside so that we can basically cinch down things when we're traveling. And Pastor John is busy working on the design and the building of the, uh, of the shelving that will go inside of it so that we can load it up. So we're getting it ready for its first big activity, which will be taking the Pathfinders back to Gillette. So uh, we want to thank the church again for the support there because losing the trailer was a big deal. And uh, we are looking forward to using it also in Sidewalk Kids Hour uh, coming next this next spring. Let's see, anything else? Oh, I must say, um, our, we want to welcome our speaker today, um, Elder Rick Jordan, who is the Ministerial Director of the Oregon Conference. I just met him, so I can't give you any more than that, but uh, we are looking forward to his speaking on the behalf of our Lord and Savior as he comes up, and uh, I think that's pretty much it. Anything else? Have I missed anything, guys? Okay, we're good. I think, I think there should be a microphone on the piano so Londa can say things and be heard, but <coughs> it's a personal thing. Okay. There have got to be moments in life when you have anxiety, moments when you're not certain about something. And I love the title of this song, just plain because it says, all your anxieties. Can you take the effects out while I'm talking? And then it doesn't echo quite so much. That's helpful. Otherwise, it sounds like we ended in a cave, which, you know, might not be a bad thing. Well, I don't know, I'm imagining a cave on the side of the ocean someplace. I, anyway, all your anxieties, all of them, everything, take it to the Lord in prayer. Is there a heart overburdened by sorrow? Is that you? Jesus is there to help you with that. Let's sing this song. Is there a heart or burned with sorrow? Is there a life weighed down by care? Come to the cross, each burden bearing. All your anxiety leaving it here. All your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear, never a friend like Jesus. 
swift to help you. No other friend so quick to hear. No other place to leave your burden. No Is that where we're going with this? Okay, I had it the wrong order, sorry. It is good to have a good wing person up here to keep me in line. All our anxieties, and that can start right here in this very room. In this very room, there's quite enough love for one like me. And in this very room, there's quite enough joy for one like me. And in quite enough hope, and quite enough power to change. is in this very room. In this very room, there's quite enough love for all of us. And in this very room, there's quite enough joy for all of us. And there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to chase away any gloom. For Jesus, Lord Jesus, is in this very room, in this very there's quite enough love for all the world. And in this very room, there's quite enough joy for all the world. And there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to chase away. Jesus, Lord Jesus, is 
in this very room. All our anxieties we can get rid of by just giving them to Jesus in this very room this morning, right now, anytime. And then he hides our soul with his love. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of a rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden And I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand with numberless blessings each moment he crowns and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed his brightness and did I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the clouds shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there a few children out there you want to come up to do offering and Jane has graciously decided to give us a story
Good morning. It's good to see you. Thank you for taking up the offering. Appreciate that. My story today is about Roland and the apple tart. Do you know what the word loyalty means? Maybe, kind of, sort of, yeah. Okay, good. This story is about loyalty. Roland never knew about the word loyalty, but he knew what it meant. He was not a very strong little boy. In fact, he was kind of delicate and had to be very careful, especially with what he ate because he had a lot of food sensitivities. And he and his mama worked hard to help him understand how important it was not to eat those different things. One of the things he was not allowed to eat was pastry. Do you know what pastry is? <laughs> I heard yum. <laughs> it's things like donuts and things like that, fruit tarts. And then one day his mama said to him, you know, Roland, I will not always be with you wherever you go. So I'm trusting that when I'm not there, you will follow your plan for being very careful what you eat. And he said, Mama, I will do my best to remember. Not long after that, he went to the country to spend time with his cousins. Oh, he had so much fun. They did all kinds of things like hide and seek and playing in the barn and such. And when it was time for dinner one night, the auntie put on a, a fruit tart on the table and that they were so the boys were extremely excited because they love fruit tart. So senior moment here. They ate their dinner. And then it was time for the fruit tart. And so Auntie was there to dish it up, gave everybody a plate. And um, Roland said, Auntie, I don't care to have any fruit tart. And she looked at him kind of strange, like everybody liked fruit tart. And one of the boys said, wow, that's too bad. That just leaves more for me. And one of the other boys said, hmm, hmm. He didn't feel very good about the responses that they gave, but he decided that that was really important for him. Then Auntie said, oh, Roland, just a little bites won't hurt you. And he said, no, thank you. I'd rather not. And so even though Roland didn't know the actual definition of loyalty, this story tells you what loyalty is. Loyalty is doing what's right, even if there isn't anyone there to see. You can go back to your seats, and I have children's bulletins today. All right, if you want to look up in your real Bibles, artificial Bibles, electronic Bibles, the verse for today, James 1, 2 to 4. I was trying to decide what version to do, but if you don't mind, I'm going to do two versions. Um, New King James and from the New Living. So first from the New King James. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. From the New Living Translation, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. 
For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. All right, as we prepare for prayer, I invite those that can would kneel as we sing our prayer song. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Heavenly Father, it is good to be in your house again and to, to worship with our church family and friends here and just Pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to fill this place and that, that our hearts will be blessed through the ministry of music and the words spoken. And just pray that you will speak through Pastor Rick and that you will give him the words to speak to us. Lord, we, we know in this world there are trials in each of us faces and it's not easy to, to go through them but Lord we will pray that you will give us strength to go through them think of those that are suffering from sickness or injury and just pray that you will continue to strengthen them and give them encouragement and Lord there may be other reasons well those may not be here and just pray that you will be with each situation that your, your will will be done lord we thank you for the beautiful weather that we've had the last few days and we look forward to the wonders of heaven that we can only imagine or can even imagine but Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Good morning. It is good to be at the Orchards Church. Um, I've been here a couple times uh, when Pastor Andy uh, has uh, spoken here. Just kind of, my wife and I came in and uh, sat back where my wife is today. And uh, my wife, Beth, and uh, two grandsons are here, Adam and Isaac, and uh, they're visiting us for a couple weeks. So uh, we've been here. And I've looked forward to coming and being able to share with you. I've known Pastor Andy for many years. We went to college together. And I know Pastor John, who I've known for 40-plus years. We uh, look a little different than we did 40-some years ago. You're not, you're not that old? Well, I'm feeling like I'm that old. So <laughs> it seems like it's been quite a while. So it is, good to be, uh, it is good to be with you today. And um, so before I begin, I, I would like to just uh, pray that God would open our eyes as we open his word. Let's pray. 
Father in heaven, as we spend time together, we'll open your word and we'll look at some verses. Father, I pray that you would open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear that which you would have us see and that which you would have us hear and that which you would have us learn today. Above all, we pray that we will grow closer in our relationship and dependence on you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love living in the Northwest. There are so many beautiful sights and and All around us, there are many trees. I mean, one of the things about the Northwest, I grew up in Idaho. My father was a logger, and he would, his his, uh, living, he would cut down trees and put them on to logging trucks, and then they'd be hauled off to a mill. This whole area, the Northwest, has a history of logging. Many communities in Washington and Oregon have radically changed because of the logging industry and how it is kind of going by the wayside compared to what it used to be. But if you ever notice a tree, a tree, it it looks uh, especially a a spruce or a a needled type tree. Uh, they, They rise up and they go, some of them are quite tall. And if you look closely, and if you don't see it when they're standing, when they are cut down, you notice that these trees are not exactly straight. They have some bends and some, some uh, different, uh, uh, Different areas where they kind of, they aren't straight, they kind of go in different areas there. And uh, I, I was interested in why is it that trees don't just grow perfectly straight? And I have a, um, a quote here I'd like to read to you. It is about stress wood. Have you ever heard of stress wood? Okay, well, this is what it says. A tree develops stress wood. It's also known as compression or reaction wood as it is blown back and forth by the wind, bending and contorting into uncomfortable positions like forms of strenuous exercise in the gym. Adapting to this stress the tree increases concentrations of cellulose to build greater strength. So trees, when the wind blows and there's snow and the rain and they're being bent back and forth, they actually produce this cellulose which creates strength. They've um, done some experiments with um, uh, different plants and, and trees in, in like a sterile environment, like a biosphere. And they grow these trees that grow to be quite tall in perfect conditions where they get just the right amount of sun, they get r- the right amount of humidity, They get the right amount of water and nutrients, and they grow, but they found that these trees are not strong. In fact, some of these trees get so large that they actually collapse under their own weight. There is something about these trees that have experienced the stress and the wind that they've had to adapt to become stronger. Now, you can tell that I walk with a, a uh, limp, a, a pretty uh, significant limp. I have some hish, hip issues. Uh, I'll share a little bit about that uh, a little bit later. But I was at uh, physical therapy uh, just uh, a couple weeks ago 
trying to build muscle in my hip area. And so I was doing some uh, very, very, very basic uh, exercises, uh, like pretending to uh, take a step and um, you know, doing, doing that. So I would get on the stairs and I would lift my left foot like I was raising it to the step and then I would put it down. Then I'd do my right foot and do this. And I would do this. And uh, there were several other exercises that I was told that I should do. At first, I'm encouraged to don't push myself because I don't want to injure myself more. But after a while, you need to go beyond, and it's not at the beginning, but later on as you're developing muscle, you need to get to the place where you go beyond just a little bit more than what you say, okay, I'm done, I'm finished, I've done my 10 reps or three reps of, uh, uh, 10 reps of three times or whatever it is. You say, okay, I'm going to go a little bit more. I have to push myself just a little bit more because that's when you really start to build muscle. So, is there anything in Scripture that talks about how we develop as Christians to be stronger, to have a, a stronger, more vibrant faith, that our relationship with God is not just stagnant or weak, but is growing? And I think the answer is found in our Scripture reading. So, again, I like uh, the New Living Translation. I'm going to uh, look at the uh, New King James uh, Version, and this is James chapter 1, beginning with verse 2. It says, My brethren, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And um, uh, there's another translation, uh, Ron. Uh, you read uh, New Living. I'm going to read the uh, contemporary English. And this is what it says in that translation. My friends, be glad, even if you have a lot of trouble. You know you, learn, you, know you learn to endure by having your faith tested. But you must learn to endure everything so that you will be completely mature and not lacking in anything. Interesting that in these translations and this passage tells us that the trials in life produce something. So I want to... Uh, uh, focus in on um, especially verse 2. It says, my brethren, count it all joy. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about what that means, that, that joy, in a little bit. So if I go through the entire sermon and I forget to come back to, and I've been known to do it once or twice, um, make sure that I come back and I mention fully what I believe it means about this joy, okay? But it says this, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. How many of you have ever experienced a trial? Anybody? Well, there's a few hands that haven't gone up. Praise God, you have not had a trial yet. 
But guess what? You will. <laughs> Trials come in many forms. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But it says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, this word fall does not just mean, okay, as you're, as you're going along in life and you trip, whoops, I accidentally fell uh, down. Um, no, this, this word really means to be picked up and violently thrown to the ground. Count it all joy when you f- are thrown to the ground. I don't like to fall. I don't like to hurt myself. You know, if I'm, if I'm, uh, if I'm uh, hammering something, I'm nailing something, and I smash my finger or my thumb, uh, something comes out. <laughs> and it's usually not, thank you, God. <laughs> wow, this feels... Thank you that you've given me this sore thumb. Or if I fall down and I break a bone, I don't just automatically say, God, thank you that I'm hurting and that it hurts so bad, tears almost want to come to my eyes. Is that the kind of joy that it's referring to here? No. But trials are something that all of us face. And they come in different shapes, different sizes. There are some small trials and there are some big trials. There are trials that, that come along and they're disruptions. And there are other trials that turn your world upside down and just completely devastates you. A child may experience a trial when they haven't quite prepared for a test at school. And so then they're bringing all of their their remembrance of the next passage where it says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. (laughs) Pray for wisdom. And so people, you know, if you haven't quite got the subject down praying, please God, help me get a good grade. That may be stressful. Or another trial for a child might be the constant fighting that they hear at home and the disruption of life between their parents or between other brothers and sisters. Trials may come for us, maybe it's a financial issue, and we live paycheck to paycheck to paycheck, and if there is an extraordinary expense that we were not planning on, oh no, my car just broke down, I don't have enough money to get it fixed, how am I going to survive? Or some other bill comes up. It's like, how how am I going to make it? Maybe you've experienced a trial like that sometime in your life. Another trial might be that you and your spouse are struggling in your relationship. And you're fighting, and there's issues that you're trying to deal with. You know, here's the reality, and I think everyone here knows, is that Christians have problems too. Believers in Jesus Christ, those that have a relationship with Jesus, also experience troubles. There are others that may uh, experience some sort of a health challenge, that they're uh, going along fine. Maybe, maybe they've grown up with, with health problems. They've been very sickly, even as a child, or they have some disease that is slowing them 
down that, that's hurting them, that is causing them not to live life in an easy way. Maybe there are some at toward, you know, later in life that they're facing a life and death type of an illness. Whatever the trial is, these trials that we come in, that, that come our way in life, how we deal with these trials makes a big difference. I think of the, um, the uh, parable in, found in uh, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount, the very last parable that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 7. It's about two men who build two identical houses. Do you know that parable? Do you know that song? The foolish man. Hey, let, let's sing it together, you know, okay? We know the foolish man and the wise man, okay? Let, let, let's do this, okay? We're, we're going to be children uh, again, okay? The foolish man built his house upon the Right, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains came tumbling down. Come on, folks, let's, let's do the motions here. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up and the house on the sand went flat. There we go. We know that one. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock and the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. Now there's another verse, but you, you get the picture. These two men had identical houses. Both of them, identical in every way except for the foundation. One, the foolish one built the house on the sand, represents the unbeliever. The one who builds the house on the rock represents the Christian, the believer, who, who builds their life and their faith on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Both the Christian and the non-Christian experience storms in life. Rains come, winds blow, floods come. The difference is the foundation. If your foundation is solid on Jesus, when those things happen, our faith is not gone, taken away. But if our faith is so shaky, built on, on promises or dreams or, or whatever on ourselves, when hard times come, we will be swept away. See, the challenge is, is Who's, who are you going to build or what are you going to build your life on? Is it going to be the things of the world or Jesus? When things happen and terrible things, whether they're small things or whether they're big things, who do you blame for those things? Because oftentimes we want to blame somebody. We want to blame somebody for, why did I get fired from my job? And oftentimes I have family members that have lost their job and they say, why did God allow me to lose my job? Well, 
if you show up to work, that might help. <laughs> if you do a good job, that might help you keep your job. There's some things that we do that create the mess that we're in. And there are other things that, there are other times in which there are things that we have no control over. But they still happen. Instead of blaming somebody, it's a natural reaction, but what we must do is take the trial that we're facing and learn to become dependent on God. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have its perfect work so that you may become perfect or mature, lacking nothing. Now, in my life, I know what it's like to experience trials. My trials are no bigger or, or uh, more difficult than yours are. We all have trials, and it's how we deal with those trials, and it's, it's our response to those trials. Uh, six years ago, almost, uh, it was June 6, 2018, I had surgery to remove my left kidney and a seven pound this size of a tumor uh, from my attached to my left kidney. It was kidney cancer. And uh, so um, I have, uh, you know, after the surgery, they checked all the margins and wanted to make sure that everything was contained. And during the surgery and for several years after, you know, the conclusion was is that I had stage three kidney cancer. But two years ago, I had a CT scan and they discovered a little tumor less than half an inch on my left iliac crest, the hip. And uh, so after going through testing and, and uh, biopsy and all of this stuff, it, they, they determined that I have not stage three kidney cancer, but I actually have stage four kidney cancer that has metastasized into my bones. And so uh, I started treatment. And uh, so for the past uh, little over a couple years, I've been on uh, uh, a couple different types of treatment. And the tumor in my hip has grown uh, so much that it has destroyed my hip. And so people say, can you get a hip replacement? No, because there's not enough structure left in the entire hip area into the pelvic area that I can, there's nothing to attach it to. My, my uh, hip joint has collapsed and my femur is a couple inches up into the cavity that's there. So there are times in which I may need to just sit I think this would be a good time to do that. Um, so, and then it's in, you know, it's in my shoulder and in different, different areas, uh, causing a lot of pain. I know what it's like to have a trial. Um, I, I praise God uh, that I'm, I'm alive because every day, every day that you and I wake up is a gift. It is not something you earn. It is not because you're good enough. It's not because you practice, you know, the, the, it, you're a vegan and you don't do... It, it's not because of those things. Those things may help you, but it's only a gift of God that you wake up every day. And uh, 
I've had a, a, my, my most recent CT scan, because now I live every three months or so, I get a CT scan. Um, I'm, I'm thankful that uh, for the past four CT scans, so that's over a year, the cancer has not spread or grown in any other organ or any other part of my uh, body. So I'm stable. I thank, I thank God for that. But I know what it's like to have trials, just like you do. And instead of, when we face these trials, instead of, instead of just, uh, you know, God, why would you allow me to go through this? And that's a natural reaction. God, I pay my tithe. I serve you. Why am I experiencing this difficulty? Just, just whatever it is in your life, you may ask those questions. Why am I f- doing this? Why do I have to face this? And we know, we understand about Job and Job having uh, uh, that experience of where he is being uh, tested. Uh, I, I don't my theology, my study of God's Word is not that He is trying to put stumbling blocks in your way. He's not trying to get you to stumble to see if you're going to make it or not. There may be times in which we are required to do that just, just for our own for our own benefit, but I believe these things that happen to us, most of these things are are a result of sin and not because God put them there. Because I don't think God purposefully causes anyone to stumble. But when we come to a trial, we are to trust. I've learned I've learned from my experience, and I've had many trials in my life, it's easy to blame, but it is more important to trust. There is, um, um, well, let me go to a, a couple passages of Scripture, and then I want to uh, read you something. Um, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 46 if you turn there, this is an encouraging, an encouraging uh, passage that um, I, I thoroughly appreciate when we struggle with problems. Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. If you don't have this marked or memorized, you need to. It says this. And you know it, you've heard it. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling." God is our refuge. A refuge is a place of safety where we turn to, where we run to in order to be protected, a refuge to go to. God is that refuge. We turn to God and we ask Him to be with us, to give us. And then it says, God is our refuge and strength. He gives you and me the strength to face whatever it is that we have to face. He's a very present help in trouble. Therefore, I will not fear. Even though life is shaking, even though it's as if I'm being torn out of the, the, the ground and thrown into the sea, as it says here concerning a mountain, being torn up and thrown. Even though that may be what's happening to me, 
I will not fear because God is my refuge and strength. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to worry. One more passage. And this is a powerful one. It's found in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. This was Paul's last letter that he wrote before he was executed. Paul had been uh, arrested for a crime he did not commit. He was put on trial. He was found guilty of a crime he did not commit. Talk about injustice. And then Paul was sentenced to death for a crime he did not commit. And so all of this had taken place, arrested, put on trial, found guilty, and the pronouncement of his punishment was death. All of this took place before Paul wrote this letter. And a few months later, Paul would in fact be beheaded. But this is what it says, a familiar passage, um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 6. Listen to that language that Paul uses. It sounds like he knows the end is coming. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You can, you can tell that Paul, as he writes this letter to Timothy, you know, <laughs> I'm being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure, there is a crown of righteousness prepared for me. He knew the time was short. And I, I've read this passage over and over again, and, and I've preached on this passage, but this is not the most powerful part of this chapter. It goes on, the most, I believe, the most powerful words in this book follow this. At verse 16, at my first defense, no one stood with me but all forsook me. So when Paul was going through, this mighty man of God, this, this guy that really turned the world upside down through the Holy Spirit, where, where he was going around preaching the gospel and introducing people to, the, to Jesus and building up the church, the most influential of all of the apostles, when he was at his trial, in his defense, it says, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Can you imagine being all alone, dealing with going through a trial? No one is there with you. No one understands what you're going through. In the darkness of night, when we're laying in bed, on heads on our pillows, and our minds are wandering and, and going a million miles an hour, and we're thinking about the trouble that we're facing, our future, whatever it is that those in that darkness that is just hanging there, we can't wait for the night to end. And we know, we feel all alone. Paul could experience that and did. Verse 17. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength. 
so that when you and I face these difficult times, we may not have the support of, of, of others there that understand what we're going through, but the Lord stands by our side and he gives us the strength that we need. And then Paul goes on and says, so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Going back to Daniel. You know, I, I love the book of Daniel. Daniel is such a great book. Not only is it a prophetic book, but it is, it is a practical book. Because we see story after story in the first part of Daniel where there are testing, there, there are challenges that Daniel and his three friends have to endure. And they meet those challenges and trials and God shows up and God is with them in the fiery furnace. How many were thrown into the, 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 the fire? Three, how many from those standing out and King Nebuchadnezzar looked in, how many were actually in there? Four, Where, who's the fourth one? Jesus. Where Jesus is there with those three men. And what about Daniel when he refused to compromise and... and uh, you know, the whole thing about not praying to any other God other than the king. He continued to pray. And he was thrown into, where was he thrown? Into a lion's den. And normally these lions were so hungry that as soon as a victim was thrown in, before they even hit the ground, they would be torn apart. But Daniel was saved. Because the mouths of the lions were closed by an angel. God is big enough. But God doesn't always. God doesn't always close the mouths of lions. God doesn't always prevent the flames from consuming. In fact, many times, the flames destroy, and many times the lion devours. And you know, I, I have studied, uh, you know, the Bible. I've taken classes, and I have a master's degree, and you know, all, all of this sort of thing. And there are some things I don't understand why. Why does God choose to heal this person and this person is not healed? Why does this person lose everything and this person prospers? Why is this happen to this person and why? We go back and forth and I don't know why God chooses to act this way in this case, and to not act in this case. I, I don't know. But what I do know is that God is good. And that if we are not saved from that situation, is God gives us the strength so that we face that difficulty. That oftentimes the first thing we do when we have a problem is we pray for deliverance. God, please deliver me. Jesus even prayed that in the garden. Deliver me. You know, if, if at all possible, may this cup pass before me. Because that was the trial. But he said, nevertheless, or no matter what, if it doesn't, he's willing to go through with it. See, we pray for deliverance, but, but I would like to suggest more than just praying for deliverance is that we try this, pray for endurance, that God gives 
me the strength, that God gives you the strength, that no matter what you face, no matter what I face, no matter what challenge that comes our way when we feel like like uh, everything is against us or, or whatever it is, may we trust God and ask for His strength because He comes alongside and upholds us and gives us the strength. And then He says here, you know, it's delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now, how could Paul say, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion when in a few short months he would be beheaded? Well, it says this in, again, verse 17, and also I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever, amen. See, in this life, we are going to experience trials and it is to these trials that we face, we may not be delivered from them, but it says that God will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me. Help me endure to the end. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. This joy is not uh, when we're in the midst of the, uh, the furnace or when we're in the lion's den. It, it may be that we're saying, God, thank you. The, some of the disciples felt this. Thank you, God, that you've given me the opportunity that I can share in what Jesus went through. There were some disciples that felt that way. But this joy, count it all joy, is really about if we could look at things, if we could look at our life from the beginning to the end, from a historical perspective, and we look at all of these things that have happened in our lives, we see that when we've been tested, the Lord is there. The Lord, we've relied on Him because there's nothing else we can do. We can't fix it ourselves. And that it is those times that God gives us the strength. And we can have joy in even the difficult things because it's producing something in us. It is producing maturity in our faith. There is one of my, uh, one of my favorite songs. It's a somewhat contemporary song. It's probably uh, five years uh, old or so. Uh, a young, younger gal by the name of Lauren Daigle um, has a song called Trust in You. Has anybody ever heard that song before? Yeah. Here's some of the words, you know. It says this, truth is you know what tomorrow brings. There's not a day ahead you have not seen. So in all things in my life and breath, I want you, Lord, and nothing else. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the trials of life are all around us. We have pain, we have hurt, we have the ugliness of living in a sinful world. Lord, I pray that wherever we are, I pray that you will 
um, deliver us from whatever difficulty we're facing. But Lord, I pray also that you will give us endurance, that you will strengthen us, that you will be by our side, and that you will give us the strength that we need in order to trust. Thank you for hearing our prayer and for being with us. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Gaither Vocal Band does a song called Through. If you haven't heard it or you did it, just I recommend looking it up again. When I saw what laid before me, Lord, I cried, what will you do? I thought he would just remove it, but he gently led me through. Let's close the today's service with, it is well with my soul. If you look at the words as we sing through this, doesn't matter if it's a good thing or a bad thing, it is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It 
It is well. It is well. With, with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well. With my soul. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we close this service, we give you praise, we give you thanks. Lord, as we leave here, I pray that you go with us every, everywhere we go. May you direct our steps. May you help each of us to trust you and to follow you. Lord, we pray that Jesus, Jesus, we pray you'd come soon. Until then, we're going to follow you. Help us in every situation. Thank you for hearing our prayer and for being our God. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. amen.